uh, to what I've been calling the data committee. It's really the committee looking at, um, uh, it just has started, but it's the committee that was discussed last year, created by Anna Albescu, who's gonna be a little bit late onto this call, about looking at the data of people going in and out of our jail system in Davidson County and figuring out if there are ways to be more beneficial, uh, if money needs to be spent in certain areas, um, that type of thing. It was a question that Anna created and you all have signed up for it. Uh, we've had our one meeting, which just started, and this is our first meeting to actually get a kind of an understanding of kind of what's going on. And uh, as you can see, we've got uh, the Sheriff of Nashville and Davidson County, Darren Hall. Uh, um, Sheriff, it looks like you're wearing a, a hat with the star behind your head. So it's a, it's a very good look for you. Um, but anyway, uh, are you gonna make a comment about that? I'm sorry. I, 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 no, I'm sorry. I know you'd think <laughs> on me about that. No problem. Um, but anyway, we, we very much appreciate the sheriff being on. So, um, sheriff, what we're going to do, we've got a, a kind of just a short agenda to start out with, and then we're going to kind of open it up for, for you to kind of tell us a little bit, uh, as this is basically the first meeting, what, um, what we need to know about how the jail system in Davidson County operates. And we had also talked about the behavioral health program that you've got going on as well. Um, we're good from five to six. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so we have some new people on the call today that were not. Uh, if you're new on this call, would you uh, just kind of unmute and tell us who you are as well? Make sure I've got it. Okay. Anybody new? I wasn't on the call last time. Um, my name is, hey, Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Ward from the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. I'm the Senior Vice President for Talent Development, but we've run a Reconnect Cafe in the Davidson County Jail for a few years in partnership with their education team. So this topic is really of interest to me. All right. Well, Laura, thanks for being on. Anybody else new to the call this time? Yeah, I'm also new. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, eight. Eight okay. um, I'm a recent uh, social work graduate, uh, resident, and then I work for the juvenile justice system um, as a like therapist. So just kind of. Okay, so we missed the first part of it. I, I heard the last part. Juvenile justice system. Do you work here yeah. in Davidson County? Yeah, I'm a recent um, MSW grad, so social work, oh, and okay. then uh, lifelong national resident. Oh, okay. Very good. Well, welcome. All right. Anybody else new that I can't see? I am. Can you all hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Hey, Sean. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm Sean. So um, I currently serve on the community oversight board. I'm also a part of the criminal justice task force with uh, Noah. I'm the chair of that particular task force and I've done work um, in prisons and um, the juvenile justice center as well. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate you being on board. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else I need to recognize? Me, me, Vice Mayor. Uh, this is Councilwoman Sandra Sepulveda. Uh, there you are. I, you're not. You're not visible, but I can hear your voice. Yes. Uh, yes. So we have Councilmember Sandra Sepulveda, who uh, was nice enough to uh, sign up for this committee with me. So we're we're the two members of the council that are a part of this group. So Sandra, thanks for being a part of this. Um, everybody else, welcome. Anybody else I need to recognize? All right. So I will tell you this. Um, <clears throat> I'm up in my office, and um, uh, either I'm doing. Um, ever since Christmas, we've had very spotty internet reception up here. So I keep going in and out. So if um, uh, if you if I disappear for a while, just keep going. Okay. So, um, Morgan, can you hear me? Okay. So, Morgan, if I disappear for a while, you just run the show, okay? Anna's the other kind of the co-chair, and you all can pick whoever you want. Uh, uh, we just kind of, we're the two that started it. But if uh, Anna's not on yet. So, if I disappear for a while, just keep going without me, okay? Great. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, I really want to get on to the sheriff because that's the main part of this meeting. Um, 
but I wanted to review just a little bit about the last meeting so you know kind of where we are. So the last meeting, all we did basically was go through, introduce ourselves, I've got that. And then we sort of discussed the overall purpose of this group, um, the need to get some hardcore data, a person's affected, what we call the revolving door, uh, its impact on families. Uh, there was a request for data on the offenses involved um, and the access to treatment. Okay, and the sheriff would know that. Uh, there was questions about the drug court and maybe some best practices there. Uh, some interest in success stories. Uh, I think Morgan was the one who asked about internal programs within facilities and, you know, the, the what, what seems to work and what doesn't. Uh, and then I know Anna had kind of ended it up by talking about funding. But then the last part of it was, you know what, why don't we get somebody There you are, you're back. Okay, I disappeared for just a minute. Okay, so um, the question was the current status of um, our system of uh, jails in Davidson County. And that was kind of how we left it. And it's like, you know what? We need to bring in somebody who can help us, who can just kind of give us a general overview and, and tell us what is, what is our system and how does it work? So with that, uh, went directly to the person who would know the most. And that's our sheriff, Darren Hall. Uh, Darren has been a sheriff for many, many years, is a um, very good person, uh, knows a lot about this stuff, um, has been, um, Darren, I think you're, you're now no longer, are you still head of the Sheriff's Association around the country or did you finally come off of that? Are you off? June of last year, uh, I'm now the first vice president, which is the best, uh, the first past president, I guess, this is the best role in the world. You have nothing to do, but uh, I've been through all those responsibilities in the middle of, middle of COVID. So glad that's over. It, it was a, a time with all going on, you know. Well, I appreciate you being on. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to kind of, if it's okay, I'm going to turn it over to you um, and let you. So basically, what this is a group of council members and citizens that are interested in this topic. This was a question that came submitted. And what we're trying to do is get a better handle on what's going on within our system. And in order to really do that, I think it's from the very beginning to understand what is our jail system in Davidson County and how does it kind of work. And particularly, um, you need to mention the behavioral health program that you help fund here in Davidson County. How does that work? So I'm going to turn it over to you. And if I disappear, Morgan, and you're in charge. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I get to hear well, 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 thank you, Vice Mayor, and and uh, I think Morgan will do well if, if you go out because you've been going out two or three times here. So I'm trusting trusting that she'll help us. But uh, if I go out, Morgan, just just take off and go. Say whatever you want. Uh, so so just real quickly because some of you guys I know, some I don't. But um, here's the deal: I was born and raised in Antioch. I grew up out in an area called Bakertown, and um, when I was 16, I read the book Helter Skelter. I wanted to know why. You know, I didn't want to know who, I want to know why. And so why people do what they do in the world of criminal justice really is in the thing of called criminology. And so I went, I went away to college to study criminology. What could we do about it? If we figure out why people do what they do, why don't we do something about it? Um, I've told this story many times, but my son asked me one time, what did I do? And I told him I run timeout first grade. And, and, and my, my whole theory was timeouts where we can try to learn something about myself. Sometimes the rules aren't fair for kids, and sometimes the kids don't follow the rules. And so I wanted my son to understand that when you're in time out, I don't love you any less. That's the truth. That's the way I feel about it. When people are in jail or prison, I don't feel any different about that person. They may have made bad decisions, and so have I. Um, but um, my, my world of growing up was trying to figure out why people do what they do and what can we do to help them not do that again. Charles Manson was <laughs> five foot two and was involved in a drug culture that ultimately, you know, did some pretty serious things. But the point is, if we only arrest him and not the problem, i.e. drugs and other things, then we haven't done anything about it. And so I've lived a life of trying to arrest the problem, not the person. The sheriff's office in Nashville does not have authority to arrest people. 
We don't arrest people. Um, my opinion is our job is to arrest the problem. And so when a person comes to jail in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, who you are is pretty easy to figure out, right? There's all kind of identification systems and we do that. The police hand us information. We book everyone who is, is brought to jail. But to be honest with you, arresting people is not hard. It's dangerous at times, but it's not hard. Arresting the problem, i.e. what all is, is compounded that person and, and what has allowed them to be caught up in a system of criminal justice and arresting that is very hard. Uh, it's oftentimes addiction. It could be economic. It could be mental health, whatever. Those are complicated issues. And so when the person arrives in jail in Nashville, our job is to, yes, we have to book you on the charges. Yes, we have to, to deal with the legal system. But to be honest with you guys, that's pretty easy. I mean, um, the hard part is to try to get the arrest of the, the circumstances under control. And so to me, that's what jails are. They're an ideal place to try to get people who oftentimes have multiple disorders going on, whether it's addictions, whether it's mental health, whether it's homelessness, whether it's trauma, whether it's, there's a lot going on. And so we're trying to arrest that part of their life so we can try to prepare them to be released into our community. Um, I have been in this all my life. I, I, I read the book Helter Skelter. I went away to college. I went to go thesis degrees. I went to graduate school. I was going to go study and research. I did, but I never wrote the thesis. That's the thing. Um, I went and studied jails from the time I lived in the country um, all my life. And so, and, and to me, uh, Nashville is a unique situation in some ways, but, um, the, the bottom line is jails in our country and Nashville are used for things that they weren't designed to do. Um, and that's not because of, uh, of anything we can have our fingers to do, but, um, a bunch of things really fast. And then you guys tell me what you're interested in talking more about, because I, I I'm obviously in the forest and the trees, the trees aren't easy for me to tell. Um, here, here's what I would tell you before COVID and before some of the reforms that we, we, we implemented in Nashville, we being of us, um, about a hundred people a day were arrested. So just, just use that as a benchmark of a hundred people a day became the standard in Nashville. So 100 people a day were brought to the jail system in Nashville. Um, up until about three years ago, uh, that number moved to about 70 a day um, prior to COVID, and today it's about 40 a day. I understand the sheriff's office receives every arrestee. We handled the, the federal case this week that was involved with the capital arrest. We will handle the, the person who is involved with the domestic. We'll handle the you know multiple, multiple murder case and everything in between, DUI, everyone. And so that number encompasses everybody in Nashville who is arrested. They come to one door, which is our building. We take them from the arresting agency, book and house them for their duration of their stay. Um, and obviously that is oftentimes awaiting trial, taking them to and from courts, taking them to and from hospitals. Uh, if they're convicted, we would then, wherever that may be, if they are bonding out or if they're released or if they're found innocent in court, they're released from us. And that happens every day um, in, in our system. So COVID has changed some of the numbers, but but I, I can tell you some things that, that just to give you an idea of, of who is coming to jail. Um, uh, believe it or not, and again, race is always a conversation for all of us to talk about, but I, I looked at this this morning just to make sure that I would say the right number. Of the people arrested yesterday, 50% uh, of those were identified as white. Okay, now, what I want you to know is that self-reported information and or police uh, report information. So what happens is if you're arrested for DUI, when they pull you over, the police officer asks you, or may, maybe not, uh, they fill out the police report, and that data comes into the system with you. And so the race of the arrestee is either self-reported or recorded by the police officer, and that's how we live within the world of race. Um, a couple of things that I would, I would want you to know, um, we, we assess everyone's what I call addiction behavior. What does that mean? We ask 
you know, when is the last time you drank? What do you drink? What about drugs? Uh, you know, how often and what and so forth. Um, the regular citizens in Nashville wouldn't understand this, but if you said someone who was coming to jail, are you addicted to alcohol? They would say no. And if you asked them, well, when's the last time you had something to drink? They would say yesterday. And how much did you drink? Three bottles of vodka. And so addiction is not something that the arrestee oftentimes understands exactly what's going on. And so what I would just tell you, having spent my lifetime of understanding why people go to jail, um, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 85 to 90 percent of people going to jail today are addicted. OK, just 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 rest comfortably that there's some form of addiction in 85 to 90 percent of the people arrested. That same statistic or the same way of, uh, of looking at it is of 100 people, if you use 100 coming to jail t- on an average day, 35 uh, percent of those are diagnosed mentally ill when they get there. Their excuse, that's not uh, their girlfriend or their. It is a diagnosis by a mental health professional upon arrival. And so what what. what Vice Mayor Shulman mentioned, um, you know, we spent a long time working on addictions. The, the jail system in Nashville runs the largest licensed alcohol and drug treatment center in the state of Tennessee. We're licensed. We provide what I, I believe is very quality addiction treatment. The problem is to get to it, you have to be arrested. I mean, the sheriff in Nashville, and to be honest with you, I don't have the ability. I can't detain people that aren't under arrest. I can't go out and offer it to people who aren't under arrest. But if you are arrested, the quality of drug and alcohol in the state of Tennessee, no, no doubt. Now, unfortunately, I wish you didn't have to get arrested to get it. Um, you know, I get a call a month from someone in Nashville saying this, hey, I need some help. What do you mean? Well, my granddaughter, what do you mean? She stole my car. She's addicted to, to heroin. Well, well, what are you saying? Well, I'm afraid she's going to die on the streets. I haven't seen her in three or four days. And the truth of the matter is, I know what that means. She needs treatment. Unfortunately, and, and, and I have no arrest powers. So don't, don't mishear what I'm saying. Unfortunately, I kick myself into the mode of, well, I wonder if she's got a probation violation warrant that we could pick her up on to get her treatment. Now, I don't go conspiracy theory here. I'm not out trying to get people arrested. But the way that that woman, oftentimes, or men too, can get treatment in our community is through the criminal justice system. Um, it's not unique to addiction. It's also true in mental health. Uh, this is a real story. A few years ago, back four or five years ago, I was at home on Saturday night. I get a phone call from one of the more prominent criminal defense attorneys in there. Hey, yeah, uh, you remember the so and so? No, I don't really remember them. Well, they played on a little league baseball team with our sons. Yeah. Well, he is off his medication, throwing the speakers and stereo down the hallway. He needs mental health treatment. Can you help me get him treatment at Middle Tennessee Mental Health? I said, what do you mean? I can't do that. I have people in the jail system who are desperately needing mental health, desperately needing mental health. I can't get them there. What are you asking me to do? And he said, well, yeah, but can't you help me get them? No. What if we get him arrested? Can you get him there? And my answer was, I'm going to do yes to that quote. A friend of mine, two hours later, he calls me back. He's in gets uh, treatment now. We got him arrested so we can get some mental health treatment. I mean, that, that's just a, a shame. But unfortunately, the ability to get treatment for mental health and addictions in our country, it's not unique to Nashville, um, has really shifted to the criminal justice system. In the 60s, we had in our country, we also said it, it unfortunately um labeled and stigmatized them as being mentally ill. So let's empty the hospitals. And over the next, you know, 40 to 50 years, our country built jails and prisons, which is a terrible way to respond to the need of people who need mental health treatment and mental health care. And we're one of the the only countries in the world who who does it that way. Um, I'll give you a real good example. I, I lived in Australia one time working in jails and prisons. And one of the things that's interesting, just to kind of give you an idea, if you're Honest, and you walked out into the a grocery store and you walked out in the parking lot and you saw a man or a woman grab their heart or chest and fall over, I suspect we would dial 911 as a citizen and say, hey, I need help. Uh, they need help. and need an ambulance. They're, they're having a problem. And we would send an ambulance out. Our city would. But if you walked out in the street and you saw a naked man singing Elvis songs or elephants are flying over, 
and and giggling and laughing. Unfortunately, our communities, our country today calls the police. Now, unfortunately, it's not all the police fault either, because when we call, they send who we have, which is a police agency. We make an arrest. We bring that arrestee to a place called the jail. And then the jail takes a person through the process called criminal not at all designed well to deal with it. The court system is not very good for it. Unfortunately, the collateral damage of a per to jail because they're mentally ill is a crime in itself, to be honest. Uh, so what's happened is it's not Nashville, but our country doesn't have a mental health system for that individual who is naked in the park singing Elvis songs and the person who drives through and says, wait a minute, you can't be naked, dial 911, what do you need? Well, the only resource is a, unfortunately, a law enforcement agency in most places. So we have conditioned ourselves as a country to make that arrest. The arrest comes to a jail facility, the jail and tries to, to provide medication and so forth. But then you take them to a court system. The court system are usually very good lawyers or lawyers who become judges and DAs and, and public defenders who are treating you as a criminal justice matter when the reality of that is you're really a mental health or a, a health care matter and it doesn't work. And so we, we have found year after year the failure of the system. So I've been here a long time and I, and I have watched the situation of addictions and mental health really take over what is the criminal justice system. I was the president of the American Correctional Association five, six, seven, eight years ago. So I got to around the world. I was in Germany one time and I got to stand up. I thought it was a really cool thing. I got to stand up. I said, my name is Darren Hall. I'm the president of the American Correctional Association. I'm representing the, the United States of America. I never thought I'd get to say that. I thought it was kind of a cool situation. I stood up and I remember the other countries laughing at me because I was representing the jail system of, our, of the United States in, in other countries. And so after I spent days with these people, from other countries representing the corrections side of it, what you learn is that we over incarcerate. And a lot of people know that. But when you really listen to who over incarcerate, what you find out is we use a criminal justice system first for a mental health system. It's just true. I mean, 33, 34% of the people arrested today belong in a mental health care facility system. Their, their crimes oftentimes aren't even crimes. What they are, is failing to comply with a government order that a mentally ill person is never going to comply with. Going to court, probation, paying fines, paying fees, when the person who's off their medication is not going to be successful at that. Other countries don't do that. So if you take 100 people that are going to jail today, if I were to tell you that 30 of those in any other modern country are going into treatment for mental health, then our arrest population and our, you will, our incarcerated population does not exceed other countries to the level that you, you read and hear so much about. So what, what I have done in the last four or five years is to try to get everybody to, to at least hear and understand what's going on. I didn't arrest anybody. But when the people are brought to us and we're assessing who they are and what they are, what you find is a large percentage in the 30s, 30 plus percent of those are diagnosed mentally ill. And they don't even understand. I mean, this is not, I don't make these stories up. I mean, a naked man standing in the airport in the middle of the afternoon in Nashville, Tennessee, in Southwest ticket uh, line to buy a, a flight. He has zero clothes on. He's in the middle of the line. He's trying to fly out of that. And it's on CNN. Everyone's talking about it because it's unacceptable. And I agree with that. But what happens is our country decides that what we do to solve it is call the police. OK, now it's not the police fault either. There's no other service to show up to, to resolve it. So the police show up a naked man must be taken away. He's brought to a system called the jail. What does the jail do? There's a booking sheet. Here's the arrest data. We then take him to the court system. The court system gives him a, you know, God knows a court data probation officer and convicts him and so forth. And so and, and there was a man on the streets. You guys have been in Nashville four or five years ago, man gets out on the street in Nashville and the interstate climbs out over the big green sign, hangs on to the edge of it. He's going to literally going to drop in the middle of the interstate. It drops, it stops traffic. We're on national news. There's helicopters. There's this negotiation to get him off the sign. You get him, you get him off the sign. What do we do? We physically book him, arrest him, charge him, convict him. 
you know, it, it's obstructing the right of way. Well, that's true, but that's totally ludicrous to think that you're going to do anything positive with a person who was really suffering from severe anxiety traffic. So he climbed up on the side to get away from the cars. What did we do with him? We arrested him, booked him, stuck him in a housing unit in a jail cell. So what I did was I gave up on that society was in my short lifetime left, that society was going to figure this out and then move the, the world of mental health and addictions out of the criminal justice system. So if they weren't going to do that, what could I do different? So I have been around town for a long time. We, we were going to build a new facility, a new jail, which most people would say, you know, we needed a new facility. We did not need more beds. We needed less beds. We didn't need more people going to jail. We needed less people going to jail. So what do you do? I said, you know, I shouldn't say this in front of the council members and, and the vice chair, but I probably wasn't totally honest, right? I mean, I didn't go over there and say, hey, we don't need all these people in jail. It would take forever to fix this system. So what I said was, give us the money to build what we need. So they gave the money to build what we needed, which I think is very effective. It is a detention center for people who are arrested adjacent to it with that same money that every other city in Nash in the country would, would do. Instead of building more beds, we built a mental health center adjacent to it on the same piece of property with money designed to build the jail. We took that money, $10 million, we built a full 60 bed behavioral care center. So what the naked man who was in the airport, the man who climbed out over the sign, the young man who threw his stereo on the hallway, when they arrive at the building called a detention center, they are assessed by mental health and they are directed directly into the hands of mental health. It's the mental health co-op is who it is. And they run a 60 bed mental health treatment center for men and women that were, were ultimately going to the criminal justice system, but we divert them out of it. And the idea is one of these days, you won't have the police show up. Right. One of these days, society will see that, I hope, as a naked man or woman needs help. No one would run around the streets naked if they, you know, obviously state of disorder. So let's get them where they belong. And society's got to get away from treating that as a crime. We also like to blame the police. The police are obviously there are faults with the police. But the reality is they're called because there's no other alternative. And once they arrive, what I said was, you bring us the person and let us, the mental health community, decide what to do with them, which was a big step. I said, I want the police officers to be Uber. You show up at the naked man and bring us the naked man with an arrest data sheet that you wanted to use and let us, the sheriff's office and the mental health co-op decide, and the DA's office, by the way, can we move that person into mental health instead of being through the criminal justice system? And so that's where we are. Unfortunately, COVID and, and some other crisis have delayed. We opened this building, uh, gosh, uh, two or three months ago. And so we've been slower getting everybody moved over there. But um, we have a male, female, 30 beds for male, 30 for, for female. Um, one more stat, and my mouth is dry, so I'll, I know you guys want to ask questions. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is we study the data a lot. 80% of people... 20% are women. That's not unusual. But if you said to me, if you asked me, of all the people who are diagnosed mentally ill in jail, what percentage of those are women and men? And I would say 50% women and 50% men. So what you find is women who represent a smaller percentage that are coming in the door, but represent half the people who are diagnosed mentally ill. Here's what the mental health professionals tell me that work in our jail system. And you're right. That doesn't mean that women are different than men. What it means is women are much willing to talk about it and share a lot of this data, as you can imagine. Have you ever been suicidal? Have you ever been on medication? Have you ever been in institutions? Men are very macho-like in jail, and it's very tough to get that data to be clean. So although the data says 50-50 male, most mental health professionals tell me that the men are under-reporting their data. And that's just that's just me sharing with you what they tell me. But um so anyway, there's a lot, I know there's a lot to talk about, but I'll, I'll be quiet questions or sit back and listen, whatever you want to do, Vice Mayor. Oh. Now nah, I got it. So, uh, Anna, I had uh, given the responsibility to Morgan to call on people if I disappeared. Uh, but um, Anna, if you will unmute. 
There you go. Hi. Okay. So, Anna, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you. If you'll let other uh, just uh, recognize people or, and, and, or they can just kind of chime in. And um, it, we got about 30 minutes to ask the sheriff all kinds of questions. And there were lots of questions from last week. So, Anna, if you'll kind of host sure. this, uh, go ahead. Sure. Um, first thing that I would want to do um, is to open up the floor um, to discuss systemic racism against the black community and also uh, the immigrant um uh, you know other other uh, persons of color communities within Nashville as well and how that is how that is being or the t how you intend to integrate those issues into your mental health agenda in terms of how your office is going to deal with that with your new facility um with that being said i would like to call upon miss kita haynes first if she is willing um to ask uh, her question in regards to that Um, hi, Anna. Um, Darren, Darren. So, um, in line with you know what Anna said, and I'm glad she said that because I know that you know you talked about you know I think you said like 50 percent of the population that was arrested was you know white, but you know that still does not excuse um, us having a conversation about systemic racism when it comes to um, the jail system when it comes to criminal justice system as a whole. And I think there are many reasons as to why it would say that that is why, like you said, your data comes from the police department. And I don't think that the police department actually has a way to distinguish um, if a person is Hispanic or if a person is, you know, another person of color. It is simply, you know, just black and white. So I think that, you know, we can look into that to see exactly what that is. But, um, you know, I, I had a, a general question as well, too. You mentioned, um, you know, people calling you about issues that, you know, a family member or something may have. And, you know, your first thought is that, oh, well, can we get this person arrested? Now, that's not what you say, but that's your first thought. And so my question is, is that in situations like this, why is it that the Sheriff's Department does not have outside agencies like a list that they could possibly refer to people when someone does call you and say, hey, like somebody is having, you know what I'm saying, a mental health crisis, what can we do? Instead of your first thought being, does this person have a probation violation? Is there any way, you know, we can get this person arrested instead of saying, okay, you know what? I have no jurisdiction there, how, but here's a list of people that you could possibly call in the community that may be able to help you instead of, you know, your family member, your loved one having to come into the criminal justice system. And then you also mentioned the things that you're doing in the criminal justice system. I think you called it arresting um, the issue, but um, we all know that, there's no cookie cutter way to address this issue and that each and every single individual they come into the system they come with these issues and they come with them for various different reasons and so you know what are you doing to center race when it comes to you know your treatment methods when it comes to dealing with people particularly people that have addiction you talked about you know your you know the system that you have in you know there your class that it's like great and it's certified and this that and the other but i mean you know, nobody is is addicted to drugs simply because they have nothing else to do. You know, there may be people that have turned to drugs simply because they're seeing their neighborhoods over police. They have seen parents and loved ones, you know, being assaulted by the police. They are seeing that, you know, that there is economic disparity, you know, within their communities. There are all of those types of things. And so we know that in order for someone to really get the help that they need when it comes to addiction, you've got to get to the root of the problem. And so just shaming someone about, oh, well, you know, you, you know, we're addicted to alcohol and so you don't need to do that because it hurts you and it hurts other people this and the other like that's not getting to the root of the problem and so again and we can talk about recidivism and all of that kind of stuff as well too but you know race plays a part in all of this and so what is your department doing to acknowledge that and then to deal with that particular issue I want, yeah, make sure you're on mute. Uh, am, I, am I off now? Is that good? Yes, yeah, so clear. I never said we went out in a room with people. We have no power to do that, no authority to do that. What, what, what the reality of that problem is, is that if you call me tonight and said, hey, look, 
I've got a nephew, niece, neighbor, friend, it doesn't matter, who really needs mental health or addiction treatment. Um, and, and you asked me, I've been here a long time, and I understand what is and isn't available in Nashville. Unfortunately, I can't give you real good advice on where to go to get addiction treatment and mental health treatment for, for your loved one, whoever it is. And so well, it's, not a, it's not about me wanting to get people arrested. Come on. I mean, I'm trying to find ways for people to get the help they need without being arrested. That's exactly what we built for a mental health center, which the, so, so the, the, the point of this whole, thing is unfortunately, not unique to Nashville, but Nashville uses the criminal justice system to provide services. So you shouldn't have to go through the criminal justice system yet. I mean, I that's just the truth. And most, most communities still don't understand who is coming to jail and why they're coming to jail. And that's, to me, that's the most important thing you should figure out. Why are people coming and what can we do about it? Um, not the person's fault. I mean, there's oftentimes there are many, many people who are generally ill and, and I, I don't at all believe that's that individual's responsibility or fault. But I think if, if society wants to keep arresting people, then we need to realize what are you doing when the person's arrested? Identify why they're coming to jail, what is going on with that person, and what can we do about that individual's needs? And that's who we are, it's what we are. Uh, race is a factor in any, any conversation, but the truth is it doesn't dictate to me, I don't decide who comes to jail. I don't, I don't sit there and say, who's going to, to mental health or to addictions treatment based on race. It's all based on what your assessment of your need is. And I think whoever, I may have mentioned it, but whoever brought this up, uh, I mean, the arrest data is those people who are brought to jail. One thing that, that would be helpful for everyone to think about is there's an element in Nashville unique to any other city that I'm familiar with. I've worked in other cities. So a police officer tonight makes an arrest. All right. What, what, what most people think is that that police officer comes and shoves you into a jail. That person doesn't, the police doesn't work for me. That's not true at all. That arresting officer takes that individual in front of a night court commissioner in our city. It's unique to most places. It's 24 hours a day. That person is a lawyer. I'm not saying they're good or bad. I'm saying that role is to validate the arrest of a police officer in our city. The sheriff's office is on the back side of that role. So what happens is the commissioner evaluates the probable cause, establishes the need for bail or not, and then commits the person to jail. In a lot of areas, most places in the country, that arrest occurs, the police officer puts you in jail tonight, you see a judge tomorrow. In Nashville, you see the judge, i.e. a judge representative, a, a lawyer, immediately. And so there's an opportunity to improve our system, if you want to do that, by the police officer who brings that person in front of a, a non, I mean, it, it's non-attached to the police department. They're a lawyer. They're supposed to be representing our community. They're the ones who decide whether you deserve to be arrested or not. It's not a police officer at all. But it gets very attention in our community and most people don't even understand it but there is a way you have to get to the jail that is non um police oriented it's it's a judicial branch and so i think there's an opportunity to to, to put pressure for all of us to say is that who you want going to jail or not um it's not always as simple as the bad officer that's fair but there is a also a judicial official who's authorizing that arrest that we all need to, to be aware of Thank you. I appreciate it. And um, just wanted to point out that um, I um, used to be a correction officer. I've been formerly incarcerated and I was also a public defender. So I'm very well aware of all of these different aspects of the justice system. So um, thank you for your answer. Thank you. All righty. Um, at this point, um, I would like to call upon Miss Jennifer Sarmadak, and I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Um, since you are on more of the mental health background, um, I thought um, you could either have support or some questions. If you have them, please voice them now. Um, sure, and I'd also, um, Sandra and um, Sepulveda and Sean uh, would still both have their hands up too, so. Um. I think they were up before me. See who has their hands up? Because I can't see. Uh, are there? Ah. Uh, I do apologize. 
So yeah, I can. I was able to pull mine up on the on the on the side. Um, I can't remember I, what yeah, button I, I hit. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's because of like my phone. Um, gotcha. But yes. Um, after you, it will be um, okay. Council member S Sandra Sepulveda, if that's okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions that I have um, is, so you had said that due to COVID, uh, less folks are going through this process and then um, ending up on the criminal jail part of it. What is the what was the criteria change um, that allowed you all to decrease the numbers? Well, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, so there there were some. Remember, I said about three or four years ago in Nashville, the number of people arrested was about a hundred per day, and that would just became a standard, uh, at least from a data source, a standard number. It went from 100 to 70-ish, if you will, before COVID for various reasons. I mean, we were involved with a major bail reform effort. A lot of people, I'm sure you guys are familiar with some of that. Um, we, we overhauled the entire pretrial release program, which, which, which changed the number of people who were coming in and out of the jail system. The, um, the use of citations in the police department was another effort. So when COVID hit, for example, when COVID hit, at the time it was Chief Anderson, for various reasons, I went to the judges, I went to the police department, I went in our own system and said, what can we use to reduce our population, to reduce the likelihood that people who are in jail could be exposed to, to COVID, staff and, and arrestee. Um, and so we were able to reduce our population dramatically, or at least for us, for, from what we were used to. And part of that was because the police then started using the citation effort more aggressively. Um, what, what does that mean? When I pull up and, and I can arrest you by, you have a misdemeanor charge, there is a law that allows them to write the citation instead of the arrest. Um, I wrote Chief Anderson two times in one week and said, I need you to use the citations via arrest. Uh, that changed dramatically the number of people physically coming to jail. We also enhanced our pretrial release criteria. So we were trying to reduce the number of people coming in by, and if you came to jail, reduce the number of people staying. And what we did was change the pretrial release criteria. If you did arrive, uh, there's all sorts of about um, uh, metrics that judges the DA's office and, and public defender had agreed to that would qualify you for pretrial release. Um, the sheriff has some authority. I released, uh, gosh, I forgot how many people it was, uh, on furlough and basically said, just you have a court date to show back up when your sentence is complete because we wanted to reduce the number of people in jail. So all this stuff was going on on the front end of COVID to get our jail population, if you will, down to a manageable number. So when we had outbreaks, we could spread people out and try to be safe with, with everyone. So there's a, a series of things that were going on. I guess the arrest data, if you want to just talk arrest, probably was most impacted by the use of citations instead of arrest. And that's a police decision. I have emails directing or begging the mayor, uh, begging the chief of police, I need you to implement this immediately. The next phase of that was, if you bring me someone, instead of staying in jail, we wanted to release more people on pretrial release instead of bail because we want uh, with the COVID and the circumstances. And so those were the criteria to try to get the numbers in, in a better place. Uh, and some point, you know, some parts of this was based on effort and then when it hit it kind of expanded that into uh you know the healthcare crisis um, and then yes no that was that was that was very helpful and i have 700 million more questions but we only have 15 minutes left um okay. and anna so we have we have sandra sepulveda and then sean witzel at the yes. white soul i'm sorry and if you want since i can see them like I can just come off mute when they're done and let you know if anybody else put their hand up. So um, I, I figured it out. Um, I've never done this platform before. I usually do Zoom, so I do apologize about um, the learning curve. Um, I, can't, I am able to see hands up now. Um, so in order, it will be council, we have council member Sandra Sepulveda and then Sean Witzel, and then anybody else uh, with their hand up after that uh, will be included. Thank you all for your patience with me. I do appreciate it. Um, Ms. Sepulveda, you have the floor. 
Thank you, Anna. And, and thank you, uh, Chair Paul, for being here and, and willing to present to us and answer questions. I, I really do appreciate that. Um, I have a couple of questions. So um, I was wondering if you would be willing to send us some of those uh, statistics that you shared with us earlier today, just so we could have that as reference. I wrote some of them down, but I think I'm missing a few. And then I I, I went onto uh, the sheriff's website and looked at uh, inmate programs you all have, um, like the offender dog program, the education program, uh, the work release, and all of that. Um, I was wondering if you would be willing to. Uh, since we're short on time, send us um, uh, just a, a brief synopsis of the those programs and how well they have worked, uh, and 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 uh, some more insight that you could provide for us because I, I am interested in seeing what programs we could take a look at that that could be updated or what other cities are doing or what other countries are doing because I, I have been looking at this for a while since I, I do have two siblings who were in the system and and, and it worked for them. So I, I just want to make sure that um, we're able to look at, at at this in a big picture sense and when budget comes up uh, have these discussions. Um, I did have a question. So something that comes up quite a bit is uh, when it comes to mental health, uh, it, it's very difficult for certain communities to be able to find support that speak their language. Um, and so this has been something we have talked about specifically in the Hispanic community quite a bit, but I'm sure it is a an issue all across the board with the Kurdish community and and, and so on. And so I wanted to ask and see if the programs you all are providing right now, if you have mental professionals who speak other languages and if you are facing barriers, what are some of the the tools that you are using to try and overcome that? Oh, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Council Member Spolvada. I, um, I, I, I appreciate the question. I will get you some statistics. I wrote some notes and, and the programs. Uh, uh, you know, kind of itemized, uh, kind of a, a theory of mine as it relates to programs. Years ago, it was a long time ago, you know, I I, um, I ran into people, I don't know if you you know this, but years ago in jails and prisons, um, the mental health community and the addictions community didn't get along. And what that meant was that if you were on mental health medication, the addiction community believed you were addicted since you shouldn't be getting treatment until you get off your meds. And I'm just going through many of things. And so I, I use that as an example, but I've always said that treatment in jail is a lot like going to the mall for me. I, I, I don't like going to the mall because when I go there for shoes, I come out with a cookie. I don't really know. I get overwhelmed. I walk in. I don't really know what I need. I don't really know how I got here. And I've always felt like the person who comes to jail, let's be honest, has so many things going on. There is the legal system going on. There is oftentimes the addiction world, i.e. mental health going on. And it's unfair for them to even know what program they want or need, to be honest with you. So it's our job, and at least in, in the sheriff's office, to provide as many and all programs that we can that may get you to reach the place where you see or want to make a change in your life, or, or, or in some cases, um, you know, make, make an understanding of what you need to do to improve your, your situation. For example, um, my staff would tell you this, those who work with me, I have never said no to anything from anybody who's ever come to me and said, I'd like to provide a program in the jail and here's what it is. I could tell you some crazy ideas and we want them all. Um, because I believe that program may reach somebody. Um, we have animal programming, we have performing arts, we have cosmetology, we have uh, you know, m one of my favorite ones, and I'm not, is is a songwriting program. People think it's about writing songs. It has nothing to do with that at all. What it really is is allowing people where their trauma has been. You know, for forever in jails, people focus in prisons. People focused on the trauma that the individual may have uh, dealt to a family member or a victim. 
the reality in jail is that the person has oftentimes been traumatized themselves as well, right? Earlier in their life. And if all we're trying to do is to punish them out of the problem, it's not going to work. So what we're trying to do is to figure out what is it about that individual that we can break down the likelihood they ever come back to jail, not because they're a bad person. It's because we don't want them to come back to jail. I mean, half of the jail beds in our community right now are full because I don't believe and we don't we shouldn't believe that the goal is to fill them up. And so so here's a good example. Years ago, we we, we had um, we I wanted to do some I was in Australia working in, in a prison system and, and they they had people who were in the prison system had to have an animal that they were responsible for. And I thought, that's pretty wild. What's what's going on? The idea was that the animal was a responsibility of the person who was in jail to clean, you know, fa- you know, uh, bathe, feed, maintain, and protect, if you will, responsibility. And you're teaching that. And so I, I lived there for a better part of a year. I flew back home. I thought, we may not be able to put animals in every person's world, but why don't we take puppies, for example, that are about to be euthanized and assign them to mothers who, while addicted, have not been responsible mothers in this in the community. And so their responsibility is to take that puppy, help, you know, feed and bathe and maintain and clean and, and hopefully teach the responsibility of a person. And you can watch people who experience that when they're sober and clean and knowing that they need to be a better parent to their children. Um, I, one of my one of the most difficult things I've ever seen was that we had, a, we had a man years ago who, you know, he had convicted on some domestic violence issues. And the point was we assigned him back in a program where he was working with animals that had. And the point was not to make him feel bad, to understand what your role is, is to work into your community. How do you deal with this animal who felt abused by humans. And so what, what they would do in the program idea was to allow them, the animal who was abused and the person who was in jail convicted of this to, to improve their livelihood. And what you would see is the individuals coming to terms while they're clean and sober with what they need to do to change their life. Because when they go back out, families and their loved ones and so forth and they have to learn to deal with those issues while they're and and, and my experience has been 99 percent of people who go to jail want to change their life or at least improve or or go back into community and be successful and productive they don't want to be there they're not bad people they may have made a bad decision i make them every day but but what we've kind of turned it into unfortunately is that a bad decision is a choice a lot of times it's not a choice there are issues underlying that choice that really make it very difficult. And so I, I think, and ultimately, mental health is, is a real simple one to kind of put your hands around because the data is pretty clear to get to. I mean, it's, we're the only country, modern country in the world that basically sends you to jail for being off your medication. I don't care if you're male, female, white, black, I don't care. I mean, that's really what happens. And so when you're sent to jail, the jail system and the court system and the police system and the criminal justice system is horrendous with dealing with it. Uh, the number one reason in the number one reason in Nashville, Tennessee, which is not a unique to any other city, the number one reason mentally ill person goes to jail tonight in Nashville is for failing to do something we asked them to do. We never should have asked them to do anyway. A court date, a fine, a probation officer. You're not going to be successful in that. And so it's a it's a failed cycle. Less than 20 percent of people who are mentally ill are ever successful on probation. Why would you put them on it? It's just built and and it's a recycling of that. And it's terrible because the illness is criminalized. And in the sixties, our country said we were gonna, we hospitals because it stigmatized them. Calling them a criminal and mentally ill, both of those or collateral damage for, for really a, an illness that should be dealt with in a treatment model, not a, not a criminal justice model at all. Thank you so much, um, Sheriff Darren Hall, for, for your answers and for, for your input. We, we do appreciate it. Um, because um, of the time, I'm going to open up the floor to Sean Witzel um, to ask the final question. Uh, thank you for, for your patience and thank you, Councilwoman Sepulveda. 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, my question is around um, the idea of the, so I'm, I work with NOAA, as I anticipated. We have a push for the for a program similar to the CAHOOTS model uh, to be utilized here in Nashville, um, the mental health version. So what I was thinking was when, when you mentioned um, police being an Uber, and so kind of what we what we want to see is um, the police not be the Uber. Um, can you all hear me? I hear a lot of feedback. Can you all hear me? Your, your audio is kind of um, fuzzy. I, I can hear. I can hear. It, I, think. I, I feel like I'm hearing somebody else's audio, but I don't know. Um, so yeah, my question. Their mute. My their mic muted. There we go. Can you all hear me now? Okay. So my question is just around the idea of the police not being the Uber, should we say? Um. So is is there a vision for there to be a time when police? Are bringing people into your facility when 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 someone other than police are bringing people into your facility, except for in extreme cases when there is danger or um, you know a heightened emergency or something? Because we still see instances where police show up and um, they still don't know how to deal with someone having a mental health crisis, and even if the intention is to just show up and bring them in somewhere. Um, that person doesn't live to see um, to see it, to see that facility because something has happened in the home or wherever this is taking place, and the person is uh, shot and killed. So I just I wanted to know if there's a a, a plan for um, other for mental health professionals to bring people to the facility. Okay, so I don't. What happens when we when we get to six? Do we all shut off the screen? I'm not sure. Please don't tell me that. I, I don't. I mean, I don't want to. But Sean, will you please call me if we go off the screen? I mean, tomorrow or the next day because this is my favorite question. I say favorite as in I'm going to talk really fast, and I'm from the south, so if I can do that, I'm just anxious. Okay, what's happening? Okay, so tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. If Darren Hall is naked in the parking lot of a Target in Memphis, Tennessee, what happens is someone calls the police and a crisis team go out and see this naked man at, at Target, and they assess on the on the scene whether it's mental health, whether it's criminal. It's called the CIT model. A lot of people talk about it. Memphis has been in the role for a long time. One of the, one of the models in in a, in a way for that. Um, that's been in the works for 25 years. Other cities have taken it up. There are drawbacks. It's good and bad. I think it's it's a really good concept. I like the pro program. I'm not against it at all. What it does take is it takes you to shift the entire police department, i.e. everyone that works there, training, and, and obviously from the mayors and police chiefs and whoever's over there. Uh, you have to you force down the model that that's kind of the, when you pull up on the scene, that's your role. You also have a couple of things that go on. So the mental health crisis counselors have to be hired and paid and they get out on the scene. And then you have to have a place in the individual once you determine Darren was just mentally criminal, so let's don't do that. And in Memphis, the police would drive away and then the, and the crisis counselor would then determine where Darren could be housed tonight because he's naked and he needs his medication. So, so what happens is in Memphis, all of that is supposed to work, and then we get me to a center tonight, non-jail, and the police drive away, and the crisis team goes back to work. That works sometimes. What really happens a lot is when the police arrive, it's very delayed, and I'm not critical. I'm just saying, so the police and the, tri uh, the crisis counselors are showing up. The beds may not be available for Darren, and so all that kind of slows down some movement. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. But I've been in this job for 20, in my, I've been elected for 20 years. And here, here's what's happened in those 20 years. And before that, I was in the sheriff's office. There has been this idea that we were going to get to the CIT model in Nashville. I could tell you so many stories that we've had. I mean, I'm not trying to be funny. We've had enough mayors around here in my 20 years. They all had an idea. And the police chiefs have an idea and about where we could move them. Where are you going to put the person? It's one thing for the police to show up. It's one thing for people wow, they need mental health treatment. Where are you going to send them? There are no beds. And so 
after 20 years, I got tired of waiting on it. And so, unfortunately, Sean, my whole point was not because I think it's the best idea. I just said, I don't have confidence that the city is going to find crisis counselors, find bed space, uh, train the police department, get a mayor, get a police chief, get everybody lined up ready to do that. And so five or six years ago, after waiting for 20 years and hearing so many stories, I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to build a building that if all that fails, if we don't have a CIT and if we don't have a police chief and a mayor and everybody on board and all, when they arrive in our facility, instead of going through the jail doors, they're going directly into mental health. It's kind of the fallback, if you will, because my vision is what you're saying. I don't want them to come to us. I don't believe a naked man needs to be in jail, shouldn't show up at all, period. But unfortunately, here's what you're going to find. And here was my biggest depression over the whole thing. Keep in mind, the number one reason a mentally ill person shows up tonight at the jail that I operate is because there's an outstanding warrant, right? Here's what's funny, not funny in a real sense. Here's what's funny about that. The police don't have any discretion over a warrant that's already been issued. So they're not really making the arrest. Unfortunately, they're not making a discretionary arrest on the scene. What happens is they see Darren, he's naked, and Darren's standing there. When the police pull up, when they run Darren's name, he's got an outstanding warrant for what? Violating probation or not going to court. So they take me to jail, not for this new thing of being naked, but these warrants that shouldn't be there. So I gave up, the sheriff, Darren, I gave up that we would ever get that done in the next few years of flushing out all those warrants. And so I built a system that I think would allow that person to be diverted if they ever show up in jail crossing my fingers that CIT model will work one day. Does that make any sense at all? And again, it's not perfect. And, and but Sean, I'd love to talk to you. That that is that is where I'm rooted right there. That I believe what you said is right. Police shouldn't be Uber. But but let I want you to get away a little bit from blaming police and here's why. The police didn't put them on probation and I'm not defending police. We should never put them on probation. Here's an example. In our community right now, we have 11 general sessions judges. One of those is a mental health judge, and she's great. Her name is Melissa Blackburn. That's her job. People get arrested tonight that are mentally ill ever get to the mental health judges courtroom. Five percent of the people. So 95 percent of the mentally ill people into the courtroom. Judges that are putting these people on these probation after the arrest have no idea how to manage mental health. So I, you know, Sean or anyone else, please, this is a conversation I really, really would like to move on, you know, help with because my building, my idea was not to enable the police to keep doing it. But instead, if you bring me a person who had this warrant that shouldn't be issued anyway, I don't want them to go back through the court system because I completely agree with what you said. All right. Uh, hey, Sheriff, um, we're being told I, I just got a message that we have to stop because they're waiting to start something else. So, okay. um, Anna, so, so, you got the last word. Uh, just tell us when the next meeting is. But, uh, Sheriff, we may have you back because we really appreciate you. Love to. Okay. Love to. Anna? Love to. Yes. Uh, thank you all for, for being here and for your excellent questions and input today. Um, thank you, Sheriff Darren Hall, for taking the time to answer our questions and meet with us today. Uh, the next meeting will be January 28th, which is two weeks from now at 5 p.m. Uh, we will be sending a link. Um, obviously before that, and if you do not receive a link, a, a link, excuse me, before that time, let me, Vice Mayor Shulman, uh, or anybody else know. Thank you all so much and have an excellent rest of the day. Looking forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thanks, Bye -bye. Thank you all so much.